In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Peace be with you, and with your spirit. I welcome you all to this Prism Mass, celebrated virtually, and yet our connection with the Lord, our possibility of spiritually entering into this moment, is very real and very deep. Agradezco la presencia de la comunidad católica hispana también en este momento en que entramos en esta misa crismal para la iglesia en esta Semana Santa. Brothers and sisters, let us acknowledge our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and in what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I ask Blessed Mary, ever Virgin, all the angels and saints and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. God, who anointed your only begotten Son with the Holy Spirit and made him Christ and Lord, graciously grant, being made sharers in his consecration, we may bear witness to your redemption in the world. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. 
Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring glad tidings to the lowly, to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to announce a year of favor from the Lord and a day of vindication by our God, to comfort all who mourn, to place on those who mourn in Zion a diadem instead of ashes, to give them oil of gladness in place of mourning, a glorious mantle instead of a listless spirit. You yourselves shall be named priests of the Lord. Ministers of our God shall you be called. I will give them their recompense faithfully. A lasting covenant I will make with them. Their descendants shall be renowned among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge them as a race the Lord has blessed. The word of the Lord. Of Revelation. Grace to you and peace from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, 
who has made us into a kingdom, priests for his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming amid the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. All the peoples of the earth will lament him. Yes, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, the one who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. The word of the Lord. Este con ustedes. Del Santo Evangelio según San Lucas. En aquel tiempo, Jesús fue a Nazaret, donde se había criado. Entró en la sinagoga, como era su costumbre hacerlo los sábados, y se levantó para hacer la lectura. Se le dio el volumen del profeta Isaías. Lo desenrolló y encontró el pasaje en que estaba escrito. El Espíritu del Señor está sobre mí, porque me ha ungido para llevar a los pobres la buena nueva, para anunciar la liberación a los cativos y la curación a los ciegos, para dar libertad a los oprimidos y proclamar el año de gracia del Señor. Enrolló el balón, lo devolvió al encargado y se sentó. Los ojos de todos los asistentes a la sinagoga estaban fijos en él. Entonces comenzó a hablar diciendo, Hoy mismo se ha cumplido este pasaje de la escritura que ustedes acaban de oír. Palabra del Señor. My brother priests, deacons and religious, and beloved faithful of the Diocese of Rockford. At this point in the Chrism Mass each year as bishop, I typically look out on this church of the Cathedral Parish of St. Peter and I see the fullness of the diocese here present. Usually at this moment, the church is full, perhaps the fullest of any moment of the year. And I'm usually looking out on a large representation of the faithful at this Mass, because they've come from the various parishes to receive the newly blessed oils for their parishes, 
There's typically a cross-section of the faithful, often ethnically, as well as by age. And among them, there is a palpable sense of joy and enthusiasm. And I'm also at this time looking at several rows of the permanent deacons of the diocese. Their presence, too, is most welcome and important because they are called and ordained for service in the church and in our parishes. And especially with their faculty to baptize, they're joined to the oil of catechumens as well as to the sacred chrism. And very prominently on this Holy Thursday morning is the presence of the presbyterate, usually up and down the sides of the sanctuary and down below. They attend in very good numbers for this mass, both because of their priestly connection to the oil of the sick and the oil of catechumens, but most especially because of the sacred chrism which anointed their priestly hands on the day of ordination. It's a central element of this mass that each year we, the priests, all together, renew our promises of ordination. And in doing so, we recall not only that important moment in that day that marked us as priests, but we also recommit to those promises. Before the Lord, we ask, how am I doing? How have we fulfilled those promises for which we will answer before the Lord one day when we hope to receive what is promised a hundred times more now in this present age, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands? and persecutions and eternal life in the age to come. And instead today the cathedral here stands empty for this chrism mass. Because of the coronavirus and the threat to public health and the common good from large and close gatherings, we're conforming to the health guidance and the shelter in place guidance. But all the more for that reason, I thank all of you who, even if you're not physically here, are following this Mass and are participating in it by social media. In its extraordinary instructions for the celebration of Holy Week this year, the Vatican's Congregation for Divine Worship and Discipline of the Sacraments gave the local bishop the option to postpone this Mass until a later date when we can all be physically together. I considered that option, but I've chosen to celebrate this Mass during this Holy Week at our usual time on Holy Thursday morning. And I did so because our faith has many facets, but one of them is a sense of a kind of normalcy that flows from the rhythm of faith. Advent precedes Christmas. That's followed by Lent, by Holy Week, by the Easter season. C.S. Lewis, in the Screwtape Letters, comments that the Lord uses this rhythm to renew us each year, and he notes that we never grow tired of it. My hope is that, even celebrated at a distance and virtually in this exceptional Holy Week, this element of normalcy and rhythm will be helpful to all of us, lay faithful and clergy, as we seek to respond spiritually to the crisis of this moment. Still, it might be asked, do our empty churches mean that in our time and place faith has been overcome, that it's been conquered? Does this emptiness mean that the church is really somehow in retreat, faced with the forces of secularization and the human and earthly reality of sickness and in death? An answer to that was given to us about two weeks ago, two weeks ago Friday, March 27th. That day at 6 p.m., Rome time, Pope Francis led a prayer for the world that has since received a great deal of commentary. Of course, we're all very familiar with the tragic situation in Italy, the frightful stories and the numbers of deaths from the virus. And because of that, St. Peter's Square and the Basilica were empty. And still Pope Francis conducted a deeply moving prayer service. And in our Catholic bones, we know that the church was fully present. First, because the Holy Father was there. Ubi Petrus, ibi Ecclesia. Where there is Peter, there is the church. That's not simply some glorification of human leadership. That phrase 
from the fathers of the church represents our faith that all of the local churches, the dioceses throughout the world, all of the faithful, the priests and the bishops are joined to that rock upon which Christ built his church for all time. The Holy Father is not simply some sort of elected leader. He's the chief witness to the faith of all time, to our faith. And he's the bearer of a unique grace to strengthen all of his brothers and sisters. Even the prayer of the church, when it is temporarily before an empty horizon, even then there's always the presence of the saints and the angels. Because of that, we are a part of the church of all time and of God's heavenly servants. The saints and angels join to pray for us and to pray with us, especially in moments of difficulty and of trial. We're not alone or abandoned, quite the opposite. And most importantly, during the time in which the Holy Father and the Church were present before that empty St. Peter's Basilica, they were before the Blessed Sacrament. Jesus was truly there. The presence of Christ in the Blessed Sacrament is the enduring reality of the institution of the Eucharist that's been entrusted to us and that the church will remember and celebrate this very night. Throughout the world today, throughout Illinois, throughout the Diocese of Rockford, there is sorrow, there is fear, there is doubt. There's a loss of employment and means to support families, there's illness, there's death. But there is also faith, there is hope, and there is charity. Our hope especially comes from the faith that understands suffering, that seeks not only to find the cross of Jesus in sorrow, but also to find the grace to carry the cross that leads us to Easter. For you, the laity, this is a moment to deepen your faith, our faith, and the church's faith. Unable to be physically present at Mass, deepen your love for it. Have we taken the Mass too much for granted? Is it the priority in life that participation in making present again in our lives the Last Supper and the sacrifice of Calvary itself should be? Likewise, have we given the Sacrament of Reconciliation, going to confession, its place in our life and our faith? We've probably all heard many of the comments that have been made about how meaningful it is at this unprecedented moment to even be able to attend Mass, even at a distance as we're doing now by social media. Please, seek to make these few weeks, and we pray to God that it be only a few weeks, without physical attendance at Mass to be a renewal of faith and a renewal of devotion. There is, of course, a danger that comes with such a moment, and that is to think that somehow this moment when Mass and even adoration of the Blessed Sacrament is being lived virtually, somehow that can replace over time our physical presence and participation in the Mass. As helpful as this virtual approach has been, we must pray and long for the very first opportunity when we could put aside our computers and our smart televisions and return to fall on our knees before Christ, raised before us at Mass and offered to us in the worthy reception of Holy Communion. This is not the first time this has happened. My attention was recently drawn to a comment made by St. Edith Stein following her arrest and prior to her execution in the concentration camps of World War II. She wrote in a letter, of course, so far there's been no Mass and Communion. Maybe that will come later. Now we have a chance to experience a little how to live purely from within. For all of us to live for Christ purely from within. Our moment has to be then like a college student video calling mom and dad from their dorm room or a deployed member of the military Skyping with spouse and kids. That is a moment that helps to be strong, that helps us not to give in to temptation and to sin. 
but it's a moment that also must create a longing for that personal encounter with Christ that comes only from being in church before the tabernacle in the confessional. We need to recapture that holy desire to be closer to Christ and to the church. Pope Francis has called upon all of us to have a wide renewal of our Catholic faith. Our age with its materialism, its shallowness at times of life, its distractions from God, needs to reflect again that God is the purpose of every human life. Just last Sunday, Palm Sunday, the Holy Father said this, we were put in this world to love him and our neighbors. Everything else passes away, only this remains. The tragedy we're experiencing at this time summons us to take seriously the things that are serious and not to be caught up in those that matter less. To rediscover that our life is of no use if it is not used to serve others. For life is measured by love. So in these holy days, in our homes, let us stand before the crucified one. Look upon the crucified one. The fullest measure of God's love for us before God who serves us to the point of giving his life and fixing our gaze on the crucified one, let us ask for the grace to live in order to serve. Take seriously the things that are serious. For you also, my brother deacons, you have your own task at this moment in sorrow and in renewal of the church. You are ordained for service. In that capacity, it's service to the poor, to the excluded, to those in need in any way. Of course, it's a moment to reflect on the danger even of service, of doing good work year after year. Do we allow it somehow to become routine instead of fresh and new as an offering to our Lord? This is a moment for our deacons also to dedicate their calling more deeply, more directly to God and to the church. And finding this chrism mass, I turn my thoughts to you, my brother priests. How important is your role and your calling during this upheaval that only a few months ago, none of us saw approaching? We've been separated from contact with our people and from the normal ministry that we love in a way that is unique in our lifetime. And I know too of the stress and the worry that many of you have as you try to administer and especially to make ends meet in the parish while sharing the economic struggles that are so painful for families, the faithful, and society in general. My brothers, you're carrying a great deal of burden in these days, and I thank you for your service, and most especially for that fulfilling of your calling. And my special thanks go to all of you who are ministering most directly to those diagnosed as having contracted the coronavirus. As always in a moment of difficulty, it's good to return to basics. For us as priests, that means recalling that each of us has been known to Jesus even before we were conceived. On that basis, we can say that from all eternity, God has not only called us, but he has called us to this moment in the life of the church and in our priestly service. Whatever our worries, whatever our fears, God has known them from eternity and he knows them now. In a very existential way, you and I are, in our configura configuration to Christ, given on the day of ordination. We're joined to Christ in his agony and his worry in the garden that we will recall this very evening. Christ began that hour by asking those priests closest to him not to be active at that moment. They were not then to plan or to program. He asked them at that moment only to pray with him. And he instructed them to pray for themselves and the grace to meet the moment. Watch and pray that you may not undergo the test. Brothers, our first task at this moment is to offer our spiritual lives to Christ on behalf of the church and the faithful. Our prayer at this moment as priests is of a value before God beyond what we can imagine, not because it is our offering, but because God in his love is so disposed to the prayers of those whom he has called. Of course, that means now that more than ever we need to be celebrating Mass daily. 
even without the physical presence of the faithful, joined by social media when that is possible. But even if we're celebrating physically alone, we fulfill the command of Christ that is burned into our souls. Do this in memory of me. We, of course, also follow daily, maybe even too closely, all of the earthly discussions about vaccines, about bending curves and social distancing. But in the end, this crisis has laid before all of us the limits of science and our own efforts, valiant as important, valiant and as important as they might be. But we must not undervalue the importance of prayer at this time, and brothers, especially priestly prayer. Spend more time as you can before the Blessed Sacrament. Pray especially for the Diocese of Rockford, for your brother priests, and for that portion of the faithful that is specifically entrusted to your ministry and care. Pray for the sick. Pray for all of those medical personnel working so hard. Pray for our government, government leaders. This is a time also to be deeply faithful to the church and her teaching because we are only witnesses to what has been handed on to us going back to Christ himself. But in every age there have been missionary priests who did serve as a model for us now. We can think about the Francis Saviors, the Isaac Jogues, and the Jean de Brebeuf. We can think of the Stanley Rothers. All were priests and missionaries. Are we not called to follow their example in this exceptional circumstance? And they were all faithful to the church. In that, they acknowledged that Christ has given to the church everything she needs. We do not change the essence of what Jesus taught or established. But each of those missionaries still sought the manner that would adapt the truth to the place and time in which he found himself. How to convey faithfully the gospel was the question for each of them, and it is for us in our moment now. I'm grateful for the faithful and respectful use of the social media as a way to keep in touch with people. Brothers, be in touch with your people and with the diocese. I can't stress enough as part of our service and administration at this moment that we need to be attentive to all of our emails, reading and responding. We're missionaries of the moment by being particularly attentive to answering the phone calls and messages from our parishioners. Those emails and flock notes and whatnot that you send to all the members of your parish, those are not just communication. They have become the missionary means of our time. At this moment, we're seeing the realization also of one of the important insights of the Second Vatican Council. That's the mutual support and the blending of the ordained priestly vocation and the graces and vocations of the faithful. We as priests bear the sacramental and administrative responsibility, but in a moment like this, how grateful we should be for the lay faithful and especially for our councils, the finance councils, the pastoral councils, as they help us to think, to pray about the life of our parish. Our missionary spirit should use this moment to seek the best way to use and blend those gifts for the good and the life of the church. Brothers, as we move shortly now to the renewal of our own priestly promises, we should hear and heed the words of Cardinal Mark Willett, the prefect of the Congregation for Bishops. He wrote this. On this solemn occasion, we ask for the grace of a new dedication of the temples of our bodies and all our faculties in the service of the body of Christ, which is the church. We are the friends of the bridegroom. Do we not wish to dedicate ourselves even more deeply to his bride whom, we also, whom he also loves through us with an unfailing love? May this renewal of our promises as friends of the bridegroom include the whole church, the community entrusted to us, the presbyterium and the diocese to which we belong, and the whole nation within the Catholicity of the church. My lay brothers and sisters, my brother deacons, my brother priests, we need in this moment to stress our unity. We are together, hopeful and confident as the church. We feel the challenge. We feel the sorrow of this moment. 
but we walk forward with confidence. We witness to others that we truly believe we will get through this and we will be better for it because Christ has guided us. He walks with us. He is through faith calling us to himself. May God bless us all. We will now have the renewal of the priestly promises. I know a number of the brothers, brother priests, are watching and participating virtually. Brothers, your response is, I do, to these the questions for our priestly promises. I'm sorry, I am, is your response. Beloved sons, on the anniversary of that day when Christ our Lord conferred his priesthood, on his apostles and on us. Are you resolved to renew in the presence of your bishop and God's holy people the promises you once made? Are you resolved to be more united with the Lord Jesus and more closely conformed to him, denying yourselves and confirming those promises about sacred duties toward Christ's church, which prompted by love of him you willingly and joyfully pledged on the day of your priestly ordination? I am. Are you resolved to be faithful stewards of the mysteries of God in the Holy Eucharist and the other liturgical rites, and to discharge faithfully the sacred office of teaching, following Christ the Head and Shepherd, not seeking any gain, but moved only by zeal for souls? I am. Now I ask especially the faithful of the diocese who are participating to respond to the questions that follow by saying, Christ, hear us, Christ, graciously hear us. As for you, dearest sons and daughters, pray for your priests, that the Lord may pour out his gifts abundantly upon them and keep them faithful as ministers of Christ the High Priest, so that they may lead you to him who is the source of salvation. Christ, hear us, Christ, graciously hear us. And pray also for me, that I may be faithful to the apostolic office entrusted to me in my lowliness, and that in your midst I may be made day by day a living and more perfect image of Christ, the priest, the good shepherd, the teacher and servant of all. Christ, hear us. Christ, graciously hear us. May the Lord keep us all in his charity and lead all of us, shepherds and flock, to eternal life. Amen.
blessing of the oil of the sick. O God, Father of all consolation, who willed to heal the infirmities of the weak through your Son, listen favorably to the prayer of faith. Send forth from the heavens, we pray, your Holy Spirit, the paraclete, upon this oil in all its richness, which you have graciously brought forth from the verdant tree to restore the body, so that by your holy blessing, everyone anointed with this oil as a safeguard for body, soul, and spirit may be freed from all pain, all infirmity, and all sickness. May your holy oil, O Lord, be blessed by you for our sake. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you forever and ever. The blessing, the oil of catechumens. O God, strength and protection of your people, who have made the oil you created a sign of strength, graciously bless this oil, and grant courage to the catechumens who will be anointed with it, so that receiving divine wisdom and power, they may understand more deeply the gospel of your Christ. They may undertake with a generous heart the labors of the Christian life, and made worthy of adoption as your sons and daughters, they may rejoice to be born again and to live in your church through Christ our Lord. Let us pray, dear brothers and sisters, to God, the Almighty Father, that he bless and sanctify this oil, the sacred chrism, so that all who are outwardly anointed with it may be inwardly transformed and come to share in eternal salvation. O God, author of all growth and spiritual progress, receive in your goodness the grateful homage that the Church joyfully offers to you through our voice. For in the beginning you commanded the earth to bring forth fruit-bearing trees, among which olive trees would arise as providers of this most rich oil, so that their fruit might serve for sacred chrism. In the spirit of prophecy, David foresaw the sacraments of your grace and sang of the oil that would gladden our faces. After the words of fences were washed away by the flood, a dove announced the restoration of peace on earth with the olive branch, foreshadowing the gift to come. In the last days, all of this has been clearly revealed. When every offense is removed to the waters of baptism, the anointing with this oil causes our faces to be joyful and serene. You also commanded your servant Moses to make his brother Aaron a priest by pouring this oil upon him after he had been washed in water. Still greater dignity was added to this when your son Jesus Christ our Lord insisted that he be washed by John in the waters of the Jordan. You sent the Holy Spirit from on high in the likeness of a dove. You declared that the witness of the voice that followed that you were well pleased in him, your only begotten son. And you were seen to confirm clearly what the prophet David had foretold in song, that Christ would be anointed with the oil of gladness above his companions. Therefore, we beseech you, Lord, be pleased to sanctify with your blessing this oil in its richness and to pour into it the strength of the Holy Spirit with the powerful working of your Christ 
from his holy name it has received the name of chrism and with it you've anointed your priests prophets kings and martyrs may you confirm the chrism you have created as a sacred sign of perfect salvation and life for those to be made new in spiritual waters of baptism may those formed into a temple of your majesty by the holiness infused through this anointing and by the cleansing of the stain of their first birth be made fragrant with the innocence of a life pleasing to you may those anointed with royal priestly and prophetic dignity be clothed with the garment of an incorruptible gift in keeping with the sacrament you have established may this oil be the chrism of salvation for those born again of water and the holy spirit may it make them partakers of eternal life and sharers of eternal glory through christ our lord Brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Lord, accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and glory of his name, for our good and the good of all his holy church. May the power of this sacrament, O Lord, we pray, mercifully wipe away what is old in us and increase in us the grace of salvation and newness of life through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God. For by the anointing of the Holy Spirit, you made your only begotten Son, High Priest of the New and Eternal Covenant. And by your wondrous design, we're pleased to decree that his one priesthood should continue in the church. For Christ not only adorns with a royal priesthood the people he's made his own, but with a brother's kindness, he also chooses men to become sharers in his sacred mystery through the laying on of hands. They are to renew in his name the sacrifice of human redemption, to set before your children the paschal banquet, to lead your holy people in charity, to nourish them with the word and strengthen them with the sacraments. As they give up their lives for you, 
and for the salvation of their brothers and sisters, they strive to be conformed to the image of Christ himself and offer you a constant witness of faith and love. And so, Lord, with all the angels and saints, we too give you thanks as in exaltation we acclaim. Therefore, most merciful Father, we make humble prayer and, and petition through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, that you accept and bless these gifts, these offerings, these holy and unblemished sacrifices, which we offer you firstly for your holy Catholic Church. Be pleased to grant her peace, to guard, unite, and govern her throughout the whole world, together with your servant, Francis, our Pope, and me, your unworthy servant, and all, all those who, holding to the truth, hand on the Catholic and apostolic faith. Therefore, Lord, we pray, graciously accept this oblation of our service, that your whole family, that of your whole family, order our days in your peace and command that we may be delivered from eternal damnation and counted among the flock you have chosen. Be pleased, we pray, O Lord, to bless, acknowledge, and approve this offering in every respect. Make it spiritual and acceptable so that it may become for us the body and blood of your most beloved Son our Lord Jesus Christ. On the day before he was to suffer, he took bread in his holy and venerable hands and with eyes raised to heaven. To you, O God, his almighty Father, giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread and gave it to his disciples, saying, take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the precious chalice in his holy and venerable hands, and once more giving you thanks, he said the blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith.
therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the blessed passion, the resurrection from the dead, and the glorious ascension into heaven of Christ your Son, our Lord, we, your servants and your holy people, offer to your glorious majesty from the gifts you've given us, this pure victim, this holy victim, this spotless victim, the holy bread of eternal life and the chalice of everlasting salvation. Be pleased to look upon these offerings with a serene and kindly countenance and to accept them as once you were pleased to accept the gifts of your servant Abel the just, the sacrifice of Abraham our father in faith, and the offering of your high priest Melchizedek, a holy sacrifice, a spotless victim. In humble prayer we ask you, almighty God, command that these gifts be borne by the hands of your holy angel to your altar on high in the sight of your divine majesty so that all of us who through this participation at the altar receive the most holy body and blood of your Son, may be filled with every grace and heavenly blessing. through whom you continue to make all these good things, O Lord. You sanctify them, fill them with life, bless them, and bestow them upon us. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Fieles a la recomendación del Salvador y siguiendo su divina enseñanza, nos atrevemos a decir, Padre nuestro que estás en el cielo, santificado sea tu nombre, venga a nosotros tu reino, hágase tu voluntad en la tierra como en el cielo, danos hoy nuestro pan de cada día, perdona nuestras ofensas como también nosotros perdonamos a los que nos ofenden, no nos dejes caer en la tentación y líbranos del mal. Líbranos de todos los males, Señor, y concédenos la paz en nuestros días, para que, ayudados por tu misericordia, vivamos siempre libres de pecado y protegidos de toda perturbación, mientras esperamos la gloriosa venida de nuestro Salvador, Jesucristo. Tuyo es el reino, tuyo el poder y la gloria por siempre, Señor. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always, and with your spirit.
Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. Let us pray. We beseech you, Almighty God, that those you renew by your sacraments may merit to become the pleasing fragrance of Christ, who lives and reigns forever and ever. At this time, each year, we simply offer the names of the jubilarians of particular note for this year in this moment of prayer for our priests and gratitude for the gift of the priesthood and for the gift of the Eucharist. It is very good that we do that. So I ask your particular prayers this year for those celebrating 10 years of ordination. Father Jeremy Trowbridge and Father Bernard Sayer. Those with 25 years of priestly ordination. Father Mietic Witt, OFM. 
Father Frederick Peterson, OSB, and Father Yashik Yunin, CR. Those with 50 years, Father William Wenting, and our special jubilary this year at 60 years, Father Aloysius Newman. To all of them, our prayers and our gratitude, both to them and most especially to God for their calling and the grace of fidelity that these markers represent. For all of us, as we conclude, how good it is for us to have this opportunity to thank God again, especially for the gifts of these oils that will be used throughout the year the oil of the sick having a particular importance now, but all of the others, because there will be baptisms, there will be ordinations, there will be confirmations. God is good in his gifts that he gives us. And we use this day to thank God for the gift of the priesthood. And we thank God, as we will celebrate in a very particular way this evening, for the gift of the Eucharist, that enduring presence of Christ linked so closely to the sacrifice of the cross and there beyond to Easter itself. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. May Almighty God bless all of you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go forth. The Mass is ended.